So here we are on the second Sunday uh, in Lent, now 10 days into this 40-day season of preparation. As we anticipate Easter Sunday with its empty tomb exclaiming uh, resurrection and new life, we're encouraged to set aside a period of time, sacred time, for self-examination and sincere prayer and a waking up to where the Holy Spirit is leading us as followers of Jesus Christ. So last week we began our time of preparation by talking about the strength to be gained if we choose to follow Jesus into the fierce landscape of the wilderness. Because doing so provides this conducive place for fasting from the noise of the world and the voices that taunt and tease and tempt and test us, trying to lure us away from God. And by intentionally embracing quiet time for solitude and reflection, Christ models strength for us to resist those voices. So, just as images of wilderness scenes provided kind of our prompts last week for our discussion of Lenten preparations, um, this week images of darkness will be our springboard. So if you remember, I showed you lots of photos last week, different wilderness scenes. And so for images of darkness today, I am going to ask you to close your eyes for the rest of the sermon. (laughs) Just kidding. I wanted to see if you would do it. (laughs) So our lectionary text for the day is the Gospel of John. This is chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And John uses the images of light and darkness a lot. Um, This is a passage that's pretty famous. It's the story of Nicodemus at night, Nick at night for short. Um, It holds within it one of probably the most memorized scripture verse known. Um, You see it often on the faces of athletes like Tim Tebow, on t-shirts, on signs by street evangelists. Um, Say it with me if you know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the one. So in, di- in addition to uh, this scripture being where that verse lies, um, there are a couple other things we need to know about. This, ver- this passage is also where the term born again originated. So we're going to look at a little bit of that because as soon as we say those words, for some in this room that is a positive connotation and for others among us, those are words of hurt and wounding. And so we'll keep that in mind as we move forward. And then finally, this passage has been used for some anti-Jewish sentiment over the years, and I would like to encourage us to not take that forward, um, to hold in mind through the whole thing, this, this is a conversation between two Jewish rabbis. So with that, may we enter into prayer. Startle us, O oh God. Startle us anew with your truth. And by the power of your living spirit, open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to these words, your holy word, that we might draw closer to Christ, empowered to go forth as his faithful disciples in the world. Amen. So listen now for God's word to you from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly, this is verily, verily, or amen, amen, which basically says pay attention to what I'm about to say next. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Uh, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. (laughs) 
you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe, but then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And feel free to join along again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And let's keep going because verse 17 is also important. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the word of the Lord. The story goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a woman who set out to discover the meaning of life. First, she read everything she could get her hands on, history, philosophy, psychology, religion. And while she became a very smart person, nothing she read gave her the answer that she was looking for. So she found other smart people and asked them about the meaning of life. But while their discussions were long and lively, no two of them agreed on the same thing, and still she had no answer. So finally, she put all her belongings into storage and she set off in search of the meaning of life. She went to South America, she went to India. Everywhere she went, um, people told her that they did not know the meaning of life, but, they had heard of a man who did, only they weren't sure where he lived. So she asked about him in every country on earth that she went to until finally, deep in the Himalayas, someone told her how to reach his house. A tiny little hut perched on the side of a mountain just below the tree line. She climbed and climbed and climbed to reach his front door. And when she finally got there, her knuckles so cold they hardly worked, she knocked. Yes, said the kind old man who opened the door. She thought she would die of happiness. I have come halfway around the world to ask you this one question, she said, gasping with breath. What is the meaning of life? Please come in and have some tea, said the old man. No, I mean, no thank you. I didn't come all this way for tea. I came for an answer. Won't you tell me please, what is the meaning of life? We shall have tea, the old man said. So she gave up and she came inside. And while he was brewing the tea, she caught her breath and began telling about him about all the books she had read, all the people she had met, all the places she had been. And the old man listened which was just as well, because he could barely get a word in edgewise because she gave him no room to reply. And as she talked, he placed a fragile teacup in her hand, and then he began to pour the tea. She was so busy talking that she did not notice when the teacup was full. So the old man kept pouring until the tea ran over the sides of the cup and spilled to the floor in a steaming waterfall. What are you doing, she yelled when the tea burned her hand. It's full. Can't you see that? Stop. There's no more room. Just so, the old man said to her. You come here wanting something from me, but what am I to do? There is no more room in your cup. Come back when it's empty and we will talk. I love this story by Barbara Brown Taylor, especially this vivid ending when hot tea is splashing everywhere, scalding the hand of the woman. She's babbling away nonstop, bragging just a bit about everything she knows to impress the sage, when all of a sudden she realizes her hand is burning and it causes her simultaneously to retract that extended pinky finger, let loose a yelp and angrily yell, stop, it's full, can't you see? See that? Oh yes, I do see, the sage implies when he replies, there's no more room in your cup. 
the woman was blind to what the sage was teaching her, which is very similar to the situation we see with Nicodemus and Jesus in our scripture reading. By the time Nicodemus approached Jesus, he had spent years of his life devoted to studying, observing, learning, committing to memory, and knowing the right answers. When we meet him in the darkness of the night, the gospel writer John describes Nicodemus as a well-learned man, a scholar and a Pharisee, a member of the ruling class in Judea. He's a leader of the Jews and presumably a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the supreme judicial court. So when he visits Jesus in the dark of night, he carried with him a cup full of everything he knew, everything he's experienced, everything he's seen, yet despite all of this knowledge, he's seeking the meaning of life. So his introductory statement to Jesus even applies that he has witnessed something special in Jesus, which has apparently made some questions swirl around in his head, questions that have apparently kept him up at night. And he needs to put these questions to rest so that he too can get some rest. So taking matters into his own hand, he makes this face-to-face visit with Jesus, one Jewish teacher to another, in hopes of gleaning some answers that will shed some light on the situation. He knocks on the door, Jesus answers, and Nicodemus spills the intro he's been working on all the way on the walkover. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God was not with them. Just as the sage in the Himalayan hut was trying to help the woman who knocked on his door see a much bigger picture regarding the meaning of life, The same is true for Jesus' response to Nicodemus when he says, very very truly, pay attention. I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above or anothen. I can picture Nicodemus raising an eyebrow and cocking his head in confusion. What does this have to do with anything? Without being born from above, anothen? The Greek word anothen is an interesting one and most likely a purposeful choice of words on Jesus' part because anothen has both a spatial connotation, meaning from above or from a higher place, as well as a temporal connotation, meaning anew, again, over and over again. So the best translation, especially since we don't have an equivalent in the English language, is to not translate it either or, not to translate it with just from above or just as again, but to try to hold those two in tension, both the spatial and temporal. So what Jesus was trying to impart, unless someone is born both from above, this higher place, and born anew, or maybe better, unless someone is born again from above, they are unable to see the kingdom of God. So, side note, here's where that phrase, born again, originated because we were trying to hold these two words in tension. But no matter which way we say it, the way Jesus said it that night was confusing for Nicodemus. He opted to process the information literally, and he asks how a grown adult can re-enter a mother's womb for a second laboring in birth. I think the tea is scalding Nicodemus's hand here. But before we look down our noses and scoff at his thought process, might we consider how similar in nature Nicodemus is to many of our 21st century church members? Think about how many of us describe ourselves as spiritually open and curious, but also rational. Nicodemus wanted to know, but more in terms of gathering data and a fuller understanding. This talk of flesh being born of flesh, spirit of spirit, the spirit blowing wherever it chooses, didn't really answer any of the questions he was grappling with. So his final response to all of Jesus' explanations summarize it so well. How? How can these things be? So just as Jesus responded to the voice of temptation with scripture last week, He does the same with Nicodemus today by sharing a story from the Hebrew scriptures that Nicodemus would know well. 
His mention of the Son of Man being lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness recalls a story from Numbers chapter 21 when the Israelites were up against war with the Canaanites. And it wasn't looking good, so they prayed to God, please let us beat the Canaanites, deliver us from this, give us victory. And so it was. And so as they're doing their victory procession out of there, they get back into the wilderness. Here we go again, you know the story. They get irritable and cross and begin grumbling against God and against Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt just to die in the desert? There's no food, no water. And by the way, we detest this miserable bread, which I always like to say manna, that literal translation of manna is what is it? So anyway, so they detest it at this point. So soon after this grumbling session, there is an incident where many start start dying from poisonous snake bites. So the people went to Moses and they say, we have sinned, Uh, we spoke against the Lord and against you, so please pray to the Lord that he'll send these snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord's response was, Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent and place it atop a pole. And for everyone that gets bit by a snake, they will be saved if they look up to this serpent on a pole and they will not die. These murmuring stories in the wilderness all have the same narrative structure. It's this pattern of the Hebrew people grumbling and complaining about their condition, falling short of trusting God and God's promise to provide for them. Over and over and over again, the Israelites are reminded and encouraged anew to have faith in God, which basically means to trust God to trust in God's provisions and protection and constant and consistent presence with them. In these biblical stories, faith does not mean belief. Moses was not challenging them to believe in particular doctrine about God. Moses was challenging them to trust that God, the great I am, would keep God's divine commitment to them. So those snake-bit dying Hebrews who looked up to the bronze serpent and lived were reminded again of God's ongoing presence with them as well as God's ability to save them. So in sharing this scripture, Jesus is making a direct correlation to those who look up to him on the cross and remember the same, that whoever believes in him will be saved from death into eternal life. In fact, he concludes it with a verse we know so well. Let's do it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Then he added that last line, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. A forever reminder that if we look up, we will be saved. Jesus is challenging Nicodemus' worldview, trying to open his eyes to the possibility that there is more to receive here, more than information, more than answers, more than academic understanding, more than intellectual endeavor. Nicodemus is being encouraged to let go of some of the religious rigidity that's been blinding him and to focus instead on seeing the kingdom of God around him. Jesus is inviting him into an encounter with the living God, into an ongoing relationship with the author of life, the author of new life, the author of resurrection life, the author of eternal life, and all the kingdom of God moments and experiences that come with that. All said and done, Jesus is inviting Nicodemus to trust him. Which brings me to the thing um, to take away from today. Our bottom line is, for every darkness intent on blinding us from seeing God in our midst, Christ illuminates the way to being made new. So at this point in the story, Nicodemus disappears into the night, but we see him two more times in the Gospel of John. In chapter seven, the festival crowds are divided over who Jesus really is. He has just made a very provocative claim about who he is in the public space. And so some people are saying, he is the Christ. No, he's a prophet. No, he's an imposter. So they're in this 
confusion and uh, division about who wants to worship him, who wants to arrest him. And so when the guards return to the chief priests and Pharisees, the leaders say, why didn't you bring him in? And the guards admitted, because no one has ever spoken the way he does. So the Pharisees counter, have you too been deceived? No leaders believe in him. No Pharisees believe in him. Only this uneducated crowd who doesn't know the law anyway. That's who believes in Jesus, and they're under God's curse. And at this point, Nicodemus speaks up. He, realizing the injustice that's materializing within this in-group bias, he boldly asks, our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they're doing, does it? And they answered, you're not from Galilee too, are you? Look it up and you will see that the prophet doesn't come from Galilee. Look it up. Intellectual understanding. Nicodemus speaking up and speaking out at a time and place difficult to do so perhaps because of his encounter with Jesus. And then in chapter 19, after Jesus has been crucified and Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take the body away for burial, it was Nicodemus who joined him, bringing with him 100 pounds of an aloe myrrh mixture. And following Jewish burial customs, the two of them took Jesus' body and they wrapped it in linen cloths, and they anointed it with these fragrant spices. And in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden with a new tomb that had never had anyone laid in it, and they laid Jesus there. Nicodemus, the one who came in the night needing answers, was one of the two who ensured Jesus' body was prepared properly for burial after his brutal death. Nicodemus, the one who came in the night needing answers, brought an extravagant offering of aloe and myrrh, a hundred pounds, and were reminded of an earlier scene when Mary anointed Jesus with oil and the house filled with the fragrance of that perfume. Perhaps the scent of myrrh filled the tomb now, a sign and symbol of what Jesus came to mean to Nicodemus. Typically, we only go to the graves of those we love. Understanding Jesus with our heads is much easier than encountering Jesus with our hearts because the former doesn't really require us to get personally involved. But eventually Nicodemus got involved. At the tomb that day, wrapping the lifeless body, Nicodemus was definitely involved. I imagine that Nicodemus finally saw the light, or better yet, the kingdom of God that Jesus had described to him. And if not then and there placing the perfume body in the tomb, then surely, 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 the next morning when that tomb was empty. Because for every darkness intent on blinding us from seeing God in our midst, Christ, illuminates the way to be made new. So it was for Nicodemus, and may it be so for each of us. Amen. Will you please pray with me? God of wilderness and nighttime, you know every darkness that keeps us from seeing you. As we devote these 40 days to you, shape us by your Holy Spirit into the image of Christ our Lord so that we may be ready by your grace to confront the power of death with the promise of eternal life.